Well, it's so nice to be invited here, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity and the chance to learn so much more about the Orthodox tradition. I think I'm the lone, perhaps, representative of uh, Western, traditional Western theology, and, um, and I'm, like everyone else here, incredibly indebted to Professor Louth for his work, um, not only on the Greek, uh, patristic and theological tradition, which has really been my means of education in this in this area, but also for his work um, on the mystical tradition more generally and on Augustine. And when I was thinking about how I might honor him uh, and deciding amongst Franciscans or Augustine, ultimately I thought perhaps um, I could honor him by sharing an aspect or way of thinking about Augustine that I've found spiritually and practically enriching um, and take that, that angle a bit more than a, a historical angle, which I've been doing more recently. So um, the topic of my paper is Augustine's psychological analogies, which of course you know are presented in the latter half of his famous work De Trinitate. And the purpose of these analogies is to establish the human mind uh, as the image of God. Augustine undertakes a project with these analogies in the De Trinitate that's been the subject of a quite, quite extensive debate over the years, what the purpose of these analogies are, um, and in particular, whether they're problematic and in need of um, criticism or, or revision. One of the big objections to these analogies is that it seems to render knowing God a kind of introverted matter of just reflecting on oneself as his image without reference to human relationships or the outside world, and it presents a kind of uh, solipsistic approach to contemplation and knowing God. And of course, there have even been suggestions that in this regard, Augustine anticipates uh, Descartes, who advocated a kind of disembodied uh, act of, of knowing himself as a thinking being as the means to proving not only his own existence, but also the existence of God. The doctrine of the Trinity on which Augustine's uh, idea of the human mind as God's image is built is also um, considered problematic in certain contexts. Some of Augustine's critics would say that his description of the unity of the three persons in terms of their relations undermines the individuality of each person and that construed in this way, the Trinity doesn't so much constitute a community of persons, but a sort of supreme individual who's hermetically sealed off in his own solipsistic glory. I've addressed that critique in another context, and so today I'd really like to focus on this question of the image of God um, in the context of the psychological analogies, which were um, very influential in the subsequent medieval Western tradition. So I've suggested that the common reading of these analogies is that they're the means by which the mind, in reflecting on itself, contemplates God. But this is an understanding of contemplation in Augustine that I want to challenge today. And on the account that I want to develop, the analogies aren't static objects of contemplation. Rather, they outline a dynamic and ongoing process of conforming to the image of a God who eternally thinks and acts in light of the knowledge of himself as the highest good. For Augustine, I'll argue, imaging God means cultivating a habit of doing what God does, but in the context in which we can do it, which is that of human knowledge and human life. In other words, conforming to the image of God means learning to appreciate and reckon with all of our human circumstances and relationships in light of the knowledge that he alone is absolutely significant. Far from a static or solipsistic affair, contemplation as Augustine understands it is absolutely constantly linked to our practical activities in the world and indeed with our relationships. To understand this, we need to begin with a brief word about the analogies themselves, which are found, of course, as I mentioned in the latter half of De Trinitate, 
Uh, and the first half, as you may know, deals with the doctrine of the Trinity in its own right. So before he launches into the discussion of the psychological analogies, and there's seven in total, Augustine pauses in book A to reflect on the God whose nature he's just outlined in the previous books. So God, as the source of everything in the world, is not subject to any of the limitations that we encounter in temporal things, um, whether in terms of space or time or in terms of his capacity. And for this reason, he cannot be grasped by the human mind, which is only predisposed to comprehend things uh, with limited spatiotemporal natures. Actually, because of our predisposition to be uh, to contemplate or to think of things that are subject to space and time, Augustine suggests that we have a d decided tendency to perceive this good or that good objects, circumstances, opportunities, relationships, or other things that we may experience as though they were the be all and end all of our existence, the source of our happiness and con contentment. Um, we can have, in a way, uh, trouble thinking otherwise because of the limitations of our knowledge. We have a tendency to ascribe the absolute significance that is attributable to God alone to things that are not God. The problem with doing this is precisely that things which are perceived by us as matters of supreme importance, which we should presumably organize our lives around, are not in fact the be all and end all of our existence. Unlike God, the things that we encounter in the world are finite and fleeting in nature. They can't make us happy in every respect, and nor can we guarantee that we'll always have access to them. So if we stake our hopes for happiness on things in this world, we'll place our happiness at the mercy of circumstances that are entirely out of our control and put ourselves, make ourselves slaves to the desires that we have that we can't possibly always fulfill. In light of this problem, Augustine's declared goal in the latter half of the De Trinitate is to transfer our desires from temporal to eternal things. And that, of course, doesn't mean that he devalues temporal things, human relationships, pursuits, possessions, and so on. God, after all, created all these things as the context for discovering and knowing him. What Augustine seemingly wants to do, rather, is to help us make the most of whatever we have and avoid becoming the cause of our own unhappiness and dissatisfaction in dealing with the circumstances of our lives. The way to do this for him is surely to seek happiness in an ultimate sense only in God, which again isn't to suggest that we shouldn't enjoy other things in life, but only to point out that we don't treat them as though they could make or break our happiness, at least even in a particular context or for a specific purpose. For Augustine, we actually have to unlearn the habit of doing this and relearn the skill of bringing knowledge of God as the supreme good to bear in all of our acts of, day, of existence. For him, this is what the life of faith is all about. It begins with the first psychological analogy of mind, knowledge, and love. With this trinity, Augustine reinforces the point that our minds only ever accumulate knowledge of things we love or things that we want. So the intellect that prizes temporal things above all else is bound to organize their whole life around achieving those things rather than ha finding happiness in God. The starting point for doing otherwise, therefore, is initially to recognize and seek to know and love God as the highest good. From this point, a person can actually apply that understanding of God as the highest good through the work of the next triad of memory, understanding, and will. So in Augustine's account, memory retains all the information of um, that the mind has acquired in the past, ideas that we've formed, experiences that we've had about which we haven't necessarily yet formed any judgments. And whenever the mind becomes aware of something in the world that it cannot explain, but has been predisposed by what we already know and love to desire to explain, a will for new understanding arises that puts in motion the pursuit of knowledge um, in order to 
ultimately obtain that knowledge which is desired. And that knowledge, in turn, of course, goes to the memory where it may give rise to new questions so that we pursue new understanding and the process begins all over again. The more automatically an idea is brought to bear in efforts to make sense of our experiences, the better memorized we can say that it is. And the idea that's most deeply committed to the memory, the idea that governs everything we do, is the one that reflects our conception of what's most important in life and affects the way that we think about everything else. While the work of memory understanding and will is to engage with natural objects of knowledge and it has an integrity in its own right, the orientation of Augustine's account here seems to be to encourage us to undertake this natural work in the light of the supreme goodness of God. So the acts of knowing we perform in this way, of course, don't reveal the nature of God himself. But the belief in God that governs and shapes the way we experience the world and assess what it finds there prevents us from making too much of the value of some things or too little of the value of others and helps us to put everything in a proper perspective. And that perspective on the things we know that aren't God is the kind of indirect knowledge of God that we can obtain in this life. It's possibly even attainable when it comes to experiences of pain or evil, which are definitely not good and not objectively valuable at all. Even so, a person operating in the light of the knowledge that nothing can make or break human happiness has the resources to see that pain also has its limits. Pain also is fleeting, and it cannot ultimately squelch the human soul. This makes it possible to make the best of circumstances which are not good by deploying the same perspective that helps us dealing with things that are good. And that's the perspective that refuses to stake hopes for happiness in things that are out of our control and places hope only in God. The process of learning to think along these lines is a laborious one, which must continually be undertaken through the work of memory, understanding, and will with a view to becoming a more consistent habit. While professing God as the ultimate object of our knowledge and desire in the mode of intellect, knowledge, love, the first analogy lays the foundation for this effort. The process still has to um, be undertaken, and of course it's a lifelong process. In other words, the image of God, who always eternally knows himself as the supreme good, has yet to be fully restored in the person seeking to reflect it. As we take steps to do that through every single act of knowing, every single act of being that results from that act of knowing, we're transformed more into the likeness of Christ who showed us as the image of God what it looks like when a human being is always informed by the spirit that seeks to glorify God the Father that recognizes his supreme goodness in every single act of human existence. Although memory and understanding and will are in the possession of all persons, Augustine's next analogy highlights that different persons have the human capacity to know and desire in very different ways. This analogy of ability, learning, and use highlights that there are as many ways of knowing God indirectly as there are human ways of knowing, human beings. All of these ways are not only valuable, but even essential for highlighting the infinite nature of God's goodness, for showing all the ways in which belief in him can make a difference to our engagement with the world. As this analogy suggests, the work of being a Christian, at least in large part, involves living in the world, doing the jobs and undertaking all the kinds of activities that humans undertake, even knitting, as we've seen, <laughs> in light of the goodness of God and finding him there. And that's what we're here for, not to do something over or above or aside from our ordinary life, responsibilities and pursuits, not to be something other than a human being, but precisely to be a human being from the perspective of faith and therefore to really be a human being in the full sense of the term. In Augustine's account, this perspective that enables us to do this doesn't involve necessarily um, 
imposing kind of our pet doctrine on everyone around us, judging others in light of our own principles, but simply working out in the nitty-gritty aspects of life the idea that things that we know and things that we think and things that we see are not the be-all and end-all of our existence, and our happiness doesn't depend on these things. While this is the means that we know God indirectly in this life, it is also the means by which we make evident to others the power of belief in God, and in that sense, his reality. The difference that belief in God makes to our lives, to the way we think about even our ideas and our theological theories, unleashes in us the potential to use our abilities and flourish in our relationships. And that in itself is a testimony to who he is and that he exists. There are a couple other analogies that Augustine mentions um, in relation to the lower powers, sensation and imagination. We saw at the beginning that our problems all kind of stem from sensation and imagination. They feed us empirical data from the world about things that we find interesting and attractive. And they kind of trick us into thinking that they're the most important things out there. My job, my family, my um, achievements, and so on and so forth. And so in that sense, they can really lead us away from God. But Augustine's point with this um, in the next section is that actually they also become in drawn in to the process of helping us reflect the image of the triune God when they're transformed in the way that I've been describing. And so even they um, can present in us a sort of analogy to the Trinity. The goal of Augustine's analogies I've been suggesting is ultimately to help us memorize how to think about the world and as we're gifted to do this under the influence of faith in God's ultimate goodness. When the mind fully remembers and understands and loves God in this way, Augustine writes, it simultaneously understands and loves um, and remembers itself. And thus, the sixth and final psychological analogy becomes apparent there. This is because a person who remembers God in everything they do um, remembers their own true purpose and potential and taps into the ability to unleash it. To be a human being who's not hindered by the sin nature which throws so many roadblocks um, in front of our capacity to flourish through this tendency we have to think of this good and that good as the good. Although this last analogy of memory, understanding, and loving the self might seem to feed into the argument that for Augustine, knowing God is a matter of knowing the self and thus a highly solipsistic affair. We learn here that it's precisely this analogy that clinches a person's ability to embrace everything in the world with an appreciation for what it is and indeed what it is not, namely God to engage with our surroundings and with others in the most constructive and life-giving way. When Christ returns and the need for faith passes away, the memory, understanding, and love of the self, which is the memory, understanding, and love of the, place, of the faith we placed in God during this life, will be transformed into a seventh and final Trinitarian analog which will determine the way in which we know and love God for eternity. Just to review, we've had mind, knowledge, and love, where we initially stated our goal that we're going to try and unlearn our habit of loving things other than God, more than God, and relearn the habit of placing him first. And that was a process that we began to actualize through the use of memory, understanding, and will and then we actualize it in our own unique ways, with our own unique capacities, through the analogy of talent, learning, and use. Then we had two analogies from sense and imagination, which I didn't mention, but um, external sensation involves the sight of the eyes, the object seen, and the attention to the object, whereas imagination involves memory of sense perceptions, 
comparison of those perceptions internally and the production of a mental image. Um, so, so far we have one, two, three, four, five, and then we have the memory, understanding, and love of the self, which is the memory and understanding and love of God, and the ultimate purpose of learning or developing a habit, in a sense, of um, memorizing being ourselves, which is memorizing being the human being God made us to be, is to help us to make effectively a seamless transition to eternity, to learn to enjoy God and to um, appreciate his goodness and the fullness of it to the greatest possible extent in the present life so as to maximize the experience of him for eternity. So thank you. <laughs>